We appreciate all of the guests who have appeared on our show and sincerely thank them for providing you, our audience, with useful information. However, the advice our guests provide is theirs, and we encourage you to seek out a professional if you have specific questions about any topic we cover on the Crushing Debt podcast. On this week's episode of the podcast, become debt-free with Profit First. Welcome to the Crushing Debt Podcast with your host, Florida attorney, Sean Yesner, where our goal is to help you get rid of the financial bullies in your life. So welcome back to this week's episode of the Crushing Debt Podcast. My name is Sean Yesner, the owner and founder of Yesner Law. And I have a very special treat for you on this week's episode. But before I get there, I do want to mention very quickly the sponsor of the Crushing Debt Podcast, and that is Attorneys First Insurance. I've had a great relationship with Sam Cohen over at Attorneys First Insurance. If you are an attorney, if you're a title company and you need errors and omissions insurance, E&O insurance, malpractice coverage, professional liability coverage, all the same thing. If you need that, then you need to talk to Sam at Attorneys First Insurance. You can reach him at sam at attorneysfirst.com or the website is attorneysfirst.com. And what Sam does is he provides malpractice coverage to attorneys and title companies all throughout the state of Florida. Now, if you happen to live outside the state of Florida and you want to look at uh, insurance, malpractice insurance for your law firm or your title company, also reach out to Sam because he can write coverage in most states. And if he can't, he can become licensed in that state or he can refer you to someone who is licensed in that state. I've had a long-term relationship with Sam Cohen, and he clearly knows his stuff. And uh, just reach out to him, even if you want a quote. If he can't help you, he will tell you. If he can't save you money, he will tell you that he can't save you money, and you're better off with the coverage that you currently have. So I am very, very excited to get to this week's guest. Now, I am recording this intro, and then we'll uh, transition into the actual interview. So a couple of things. My guest this week, I'm very excited, is Mike Michalowicz. Uh, I read his book, Profit First, a couple of years ago, and it totally uh, changed the way that I look at money, the way that I look at cash flows, the way that I look at budgeting and, and, and accounting. And, and I'm an accounting uh, major in, in undergrad, and still his book, Profit First, changed the way that I look at money entirely. And so I'll have a link uh, if you want to go check out the Profit First book. Uh, we also talk about his newest book, but let me give you his introduction. So Mike Michalowicz is the author of Profit First, Clockwork, Sir, the Pumpkin Plan, and now his newest release, Fix This Next. By his 35th birthday, Mike had founded and sold two companies, one to a private equity firm and another to a Fortune 500 firm. Today, he's running his third multi-million dollar venture, Profit First Professionals. Mike is a former small business consultant for the Wall Street Journal and the former business makeover specialist on MSNBC. Over the years, Mike has traveled the globe speaking with thousands of entrepreneurs, and he's here to sh- today to share the best of what he has learned. And so we'll transition into my interview here with Mike in a minute. A couple things I do want you to know. Um, it was a fantastic interview. I, I was totally uh, geeking out over what he was saying. We do talk about profit first. We talk about COVID. We talk about the impact of COVID on the Profit First system. Uh, We talk about uh, some of the different concepts within Profit First. We talk about one of his uh, great Profit First uh, success stories. Uh, We do talk a little bit about uh, Fix This Next. I do give him time to talk a little bit about Fix This Next. And again, I'll link to Profit First and I'll link to Fix This Next. Uh, If you're interested in either of those books, I'll link to those uh, in the show notes here in, in the description of the podcast. But I had a great time Mike is a great guy. Uh, a handful of technical glitches here and there, but uh, I think the content is so great that uh, I'm willing to, to skip over some of those technical glitches, uh, sound glitches, as you'll hear. Mike, as he was recording this with me, uh, had uh, no internet, so he was doing this on his iPad with his phone as the as the hub for the iPad, and it was you know, a little bit, a little bit crazy, but we, we powered through it. And I think it, it made for a great, great episode. So a ton of thanks to Mike for, for his time in providing all of you with, uh, some of his insights into profit first. And with that, let's transition over into the interview. 
So thanks, Mike, for being on this week's episode of the podcast. Oh, sure. It's a joy. Thanks for having me, particularly under these weird circumstances with our internet and power and audacity problems. Yeah, and people mowing in the backyard and all kinds exactly. of craziness going on. Exactly. So, so, But I do appreciate it. I wanted to start with uh, sort of a quick uh, icebreaker. And so what I wanted to know real quick, something totally off the topic, um, if you were an emoji, my I have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. They love the emoji movie. If you were an emoji... Which one would it be and why? I would be a huge ear. I think the reason I'd be a huge ear is because no one uses that one, and there is one buried in there. So people are like, what the hell? But also, maybe it's a reminder for me to listen more than I speak. That's awesome. Yeah, that's probably what I need to start doing is listening more, especially to my wife and kids. So, <laughs> Ditto. Not uh, your wife and kids, my wife and kids. Just well, yeah. Care. I'll listen to mine. You can listen to yours. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so... I did want to sort of jump in. I, I, I read Profit First. I'm a, I'm a huge fan uh, of Profit First. And in trying to help my clients uh, get rid of their, their debt, uh, I often recommend a lot of them grab it and read it, whether they're individuals, whether they're business owners. But my, my question is, we're recording this sort of in, in the middle of all this COVID-19 and coronavirus. And so have you seen that uh, COVID has impacted or how has COVID impacted the Profit First system? I've seen people early on when COVID hit adjusting a profit first system to their detriment, not intentionally, but they were trying to be proactive. So I was getting calls and emails from folks that were saying, Hey, because COVID's coming, I'm going to reduce my profit percentage, put more money into my OPEX so I can navigate through this. And I'm like, Whoa, no, not so fast. Um, other people, by the way, said, well, maybe there's an opportunity here to increase profit. And I also said, not so fast. You know, the idea of profit first is once you set a percentage, over time, we enhance those percentages for profitability, controlling our costs, eradicating debt. But if we, quote unquote, proactively make adjustments, then our business won't get to speak to us. The whole idea about profit first is when you start, when you set your percentages, if you can't pay your bills at that point, that's your business speaking to you that there's an adjustment needed within your business, cut expenses, increase margin. But if people are in, intentionally increasing their operating cash, reducing their profit before there's any problem, that's itself, it gets muted because we've made more cash available. So the appropriate approach for profit first is don't change a thing. When circumstances around you don't change a thing, your business will tell you if there's a problem, it speaks to you, and then you need to adjust. So that was the key thing is people trying to be proactive. But the people that kept their profit percentages the same are now hearing or feeling the pressure. Not all of them, but some of them are seeing, oh my gosh, sales are dropped, revenue is down. Um, I see my OPEX is dwindling. I need to make some adjustments to my business by cutting costs or increasing margin or reinventing what I sell. That is the right response, a reinvention, not a reaction even before it happens. If that's even makes sense, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I think that's interesting, yeah. Um, so yeah. sort of along the same lines, um, what are your thoughts on – people that may have had to take out a, a PPP loan or, or an EDL, an economic injury loan. What are your thoughts on how those things might factor in? I know that's debt, but how does that factor into profit first and, and how I would analyze my numbers? Yeah. Whenever we take a loan, PPP or otherwise, the critical question we need to ask ourselves is why do we need this loan in the first place? You know, Many people took the loan just because it was a quick knee-jerk reaction. It was a, a desperation uh, reaction. Everyone was running for it. It's kind of like when we ran out of toilet paper. Other people were getting it, so I better get my toilet paper right away. And if you don't, toilet paper's going to be gone. What we need to do is, before we take a loan, and I'm not putting judgment if the PPP loan is appropriate or not, we just need to qualify. And I think there's actually three forms of debt. There's what's called debt leveraging, which many people say are debt leveraging when they're not. Debt leveraging is where if I borrow, Sean, from you a dollar, and I have a guaranteed return of, say, $2 within a guaranteed time frame of, say, a month. If I know I'm going to get $2 back within a month, now I can leverage that debt, borrow money to make money, pay my debt back to you, that dollar plus interest, and I come out ahead. That's debt leveraging. There's another thing called debt bridging. Debt bridging is where you cover through, through a known gap in business. So a seasonal business will do this. Or if I know I can't cover payroll this week, but... I do know those big invoices are coming in the week after, and I'll be able to pay payroll then. I may borrow money to bridge me through that gap and pay it back. But there's a third form of debt. It's a name I give it. I call it a debt anchor. 
a debt anchor or debt anchoring is where we take debt without any expectation of return, without any known gap period. So as we have this COVID crisis, some businesses are like, I just got to stay in business for the next few months. Is it going to last a few months? Back then in March, it was possible. Now it's like, will this last for eternity? We don't know. Without a clear return to normal for revenue, uh, a debt bridge is a bridge to nowhere and you fall off the edge. And you may be stabbing your problem for a, a month or two, but then we're going to have the exact same problem. So we need to adjust the business immediately. Debt leveraging, well, many businesses say they're debt leveraging. The question is, if you're taking on debt now, where can you use it as an opportunity to get more revenue in return? Many debt anchored. They took on money without knowing how they're going to be able to recover that or how it's going to serve the business. Now, there's one unique circumstance about PPP, which is you know, pretty, pretty uncommon. And it's that the government is offering, and you know, there's certain prayers you got to meet, but to forgive those loans, meaning it's not a loan, it's a grant. They're just saying, here's money, it's free money. So if you can get money for free, it's actually some degree foolish not to take that money. If all my competitors, my business get free money, say $50,000 or $100,000, and I say, well, I don't need it, I don't take that money, now I'm at a disadvantage because they can use that money to, the, to their advantage. So the PPP loan is a unique circumstance where it may be a grant. Just know you're going into it without the need to return that money. And then I think you'd be foolish, just on pure logic, not to take the money. Okay, I understand. And so if, if I'm understanding both questions, really, it's more that you would use the profit first system to budget, to extrapolate, to forecast, and then adjust the numbers accordingly rather than, oh my gosh, I need this, I need this, I need this. And, and in, or, in other words, using profit first for what it's designed for to be proactive rather than reactionary. Yeah, the, the profit first system gets you in tune with your cash flow management up to the minute. It's a bank balance based accounting system or cash flow management system is probably a better choice of words. What happens is I can log into my bank account today, albeit I do need internet. Just have to put a little zinger out to the hurricane gods. But if I had internet and I could connect, um, I could see what my bank balances are. Once I can see my bank balance, I know on a day to day basis, because with profit first, we pre allocate money to its intended use. One is to pay taxes. One is to pay operating expenses. One is to pay profits to the owner, um, which there is an exception to that rule. If, if there is debt, we can use profit to eradicate debt. Uh, there's an account to service debt and so forth. You know what the money is available for what purpose. And you know it literally to the second. So what we do is we simply observe it by logging into our bank account regularly, weekly, daily, a habit that most entrepreneurs have anyway. Just keep logging in. But since money is pre-allocated to its intended use, you see, is the money dwindling? Uh, is the money amplifying? How's my revenue doing on a cash flow basis? And then we can make prudent decisions. So if you were doing profit first going into this COVID crisis, don't change a thing. Keep watching. And then you see like, you know, now we're, as recording this, we're like four months in, I think, maybe we're going to the fifth month of this. What we can do is we watch how our revenue is affected, how cash allocation is affected. And for many businesses that have retail fronts and stuff like that, We've seen, of course, no surprise here, a slowdown in, in revenue and therefore a slowdown in profit and reserves. Then it's like, oh, that might be a trigger to take a loan to uh, pay off some uh, payroll or, or whatever purpose. But you'll, you'll have a much more keen sense of why you need it. And that's what we need. Before we take on any debt, why do we need this debt? Again, I just got with the asterisk. This is a very unique circumstance that this could be a forgiven loan and it's free cash. Money is being handed to you. But we should, even if money is just handed to us, we should still have an intended use. You know, that PPP loan isn't, and sadly I've seen this, used to get a new car or something. Like, and, and people are, but it's all for payroll. Yeah, yeah, but people are putting in the payroll account and employing from another account to buy a car. They're, they're, they're sneaking on past the goaltender, they think. But they're really hurting their business because they're not determining what the business needs that money for. And sort of along the same lines, I think, and you may have even answered the question, I think one of the things that that I struggled with in in reading Profit First and, and trying to implement some of the stuff in there was having the the multiples of bank accounts, especially as an attorney, I've got to add one in there, which is my IOTA trust account, my escrow account, the, the client yes. funds account. And, and I get the sense that that's what most people struggle with. So can you talk a little bit about why and I remember from the book, it's sort of based on the envelope system. I take X yes. amount of bucks and put it in this envelope and that envelope. But can you talk a little bit about why it's so important to have the different 
the different bank accounts. And am I right? Yeah. Is, is that one of the struggles that you see most often with the people in the... Definitely one of the... Yeah, yeah. We call it get your butt to the bank. It's, it's actually <laughs> one of the biggest hurdles to setting it up, which ironic, you know, that can take a half hour. You can do it online. It's so easy to do. Yet, if we get past... Yeah, that's many people stop at this point, but if you get past this hurdle, the benefit's significant. Here's the reason why it must be at the bank. Most business owners do bank balance accounting. Most businesses do not read their accounting system, know what their cash flow statement is, their balance sheet, income. They don't know how to tie them together. So we follow a shortcut, which is we log into our bank account and see if we have money or not. But the problem is in that circumstance where we have a one account set up, that's the most normal setup. We have you know one primary checking account where we collect money and pay bills from. If there's one account, when we log in, if we see a $1,000 deposit, for example, we say, oh, I have $1,000 for my business. And that's absolutely not true. What happens by saying multiple accounts at your bank, like the envelope system, when money comes in, we then first pre-allocate money to its intended use. Some is to profit. That's a reward for being a shareholder. Some is to owner's comp. That's actually pay for the job you do within your business, different than profit. Profit's a reward for starting business. Um, taxes, you know, we already get that whacked by a tax bill. OpEx, you could have that IOTA account. There's always different accounts you can set up. When money flows in, then we allocate it based upon percentages and there's some unique circumstances. If it's an escrow account, money flowing in may be a full allocation to the escrow account. Then, now when I log in, I see what money is intended for what, you, what use before I spend it. Most entrepreneurs log in their bank system to see how much money they have. Therefore, that's our natural path. For example, I wanted to start exercising a lot. I've always been sporadic, but in the last five years, I've been religious. How did I make that conversion was I saw that my natural path, when I wake up in the morning, um, even though I say I need to work out first, I go to the bathroom and then I get a cup of coffee and then I don't do it. Well, what I realized is the very first thing I do when I walk out of bed is go to the bathroom. I started putting my sneakers on top of the toilet seat. The only way I can use the bathroom now is gym shoes and putting them on my feet. I'm like, ah, oh, let me just go to the gym. The only way you can log in your bank account now is when you do log in, you see what money is available for what purpose before you spend it. It puts those gym shoes on right away instead of the old behavior of, oh, I have $1,000 and we just spend on the next thing. So that's why this this is necessary at the bank. It intercepts our behavioral path. Yeah, and that's I'm, I'm a huge uh, believer in mindset. And so a lot of the things you're talking about, uh, you know, changing, changing mindset, changing beliefs, changing habits, doing all that stuff, I'm a... I'm a lawyer, but I'm sort of a, a geek about some of that kind of stuff. Although I think one of the reasons I was so drawn to the profit first system is that my background, my undergrad degree is actually in accounting. So oh, that's awesome. cash flows, one, and, two punch. yeah, cash flows, P and L's balance sheets. I get all that, which I guess sort of comes in handy when you're a bankruptcy attorney as well. Um, yeah, yeah. For the work you do, yeah. but you know, the vast majority of entrepreneurs, including myself who studied accounting in college, I don't know how to do it. Many entrepreneurs do have multi-million dollar revenue businesses without understanding how to read their accounting. I really don't know how to read a cash flow statement. And I, I honestly, I question if my accountant does. The, the cash flow statement, its intention is to show the change in flow of money. And it's a very important facet of running a business, yet I never looked at it. My natural path was always logging my bank account. And that's why we need this there. You know, some people try to outsmart the profit for systems. I'll do it on a spreadsheet. Or I'll do it in my accounting system. And I'm like, well, you know, your accounting system has a thing called the GL, the general ledger. It's already accounting where your money's going. How's that working for you? You've been doing it for years, ever since you set up an accounting system. People are like, well, I'm still not profitable. Therefore, we've proven that following traditional cash flow management using accounting is not serving us. We simply need the system. And, and the last thing I want to share is the profit first system does not replace your accounting. This is an umbrella on top of it. It channels our behavior to drive profit. It does not change the way we do our accounting. Yeah, and, and I've always joked that I, I am not a CPA. And so, yeah, I get it that the profit first layers over the the accounting system. And I've told people, I've been frankly honest about, you know, my accounting degree qualifies me to run a calculator. And I think that's about it. But um, <laughs> what I, I wanted to do, two quick things here. We're, we're sort of getting – I know you've got a, a time element here, but two, two last things real quick. Can you recall and, – and obviously we don't need any kind of specific names or anything, but can you recall a story of someone who used Profit First to uh, pull out of a, a profit nosedive, pull out of a situation, prevent filing a bankruptcy? Do you have any stories like that? Oh, yeah, yeah, and I will use a name because uh – uh this company is kind of boastful about how they made the turn. And it's a really interesting case study. You got to Google this one. 
It's the Savannah Bananas. They are a baseball team out of Savannah. Uh, they're in what's called the minor and all-star leagues, which if you know uh, anything about baseball, that league is a money loser. If you are in that space, you're guaranteed to lose money. Average attendance for baseball games, about 100 people, fans and friends and family of the players. Savannah Bananas implemented profit first, and it was very clear that uh, it didn't even make sense paying for the scoreboard, the electric scoreboard. And it made it very clear that they had to reinvent how they made higher margins, you know, new ways to sell tickets. Well, fast forward to today, Savannah Bananas, minus the COVID crisis, uh, because they have to shut down their stadium, was getting attendance of 4,500 people, shy of, just shy of 5,000 people per game, every game. They reinvented the way baseball is done because they were, it was very clear from the profit first system that they continued to do baseball the old way, they were going to go for bankruptcy. The bankruptcy was the next stage. They turned around a team. They turned around a community. The Galveston, I think it's called Galveston, but don't quote me on that. Uh, this is outside Savannah where the baseball stadium is. And, uh, it, it's brought a robustness now to the community economically. And the, and the reason is, is when they did profit first, they had to cut costs. But the bigger element is you have to increase margin. Any business can cut costs uh, to a certain point. But at a certain point, you're cutting so much cost that you can't function. So you can reduce some cost. The bigger opportunity is increasing margin. How do you reinvent what you do? How do you show more value to your customers? Uh, and that's what the Spanish Bananas did. And as a result, they're extremely profitable um, on a percentage basis. I think they're even more profitable than uh, many baseball teams on the major leagues yeah. on a percentage basis. You know, I, I know the Savannah Bananas because, um, you know, I'm here in Tampa. Uh, Chris Kremitzos is here. He ru uh, runs PodFest. He's got a whole bunch of different podcasts going on. And, and I know he's a big fan of the Savannah Bananas and his, uh, you know, podcast seminar, PodFest. Uh, they've been out there uh, a handful of times. And so I, I've met the guy and, and it's, Jesse I agree. Coles, you know, that's awesome. Yeah, it's a, that's a tremendous story. So um, as we sort of get to the end, I know that you know, Profit First is what's had the biggest impact on me. I am going to go online. I know you've got a new book called Fix This Next. Um, I'm going to go order it. I wanted to give you a chance to promote Fix This Next as well. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sean. Fix This Next, I would argue, is, is the most important book I've written in my life, up to this point at least. And uh, I, I tackle what I believe to be the biggest problem in entrepreneurship, but something even bigger than profitability. And the number one challenge entrepreneurs have is actually knowing what their challenge is. We rush, there's a saying that we rush the urgent over the uh, important. I, I want to take that further. I actually argue that's not correct. We don't rush the urgent. We rush to the apparent. And uh, there's a significant difference here. Apparent is the next issue that presents itself. We're, we're the ones who elect to put urgency on it. So of the hundreds of things we can do at any given moment, we are selecting it based upon what presents itself in email, a question that comes to the door, the phone rings. So the question, of course, is what is the one thing our business needs from us most? What's the one thing that will move our business forward? So in Fix This Next, it's a way to pinpoint what you need to do for your business next. Once you nail that, then what comes after that and so forth. Instead of going that kind of circuitous pattern where we're lost in the woods, putting out fires constantly in our business, now we start moving deliberately forward, have deliberate growth because we fix the right thing at the right time. That's what this book's about. Very cool. Thank you. Um, well, as we sort of wrap up here, is there anything that I didn't ask, uh, anything that you wanted to talk about other than fix this next? Um, anything else that, that I may have missed or you wanted to add? I think this is our time to um, to step up as small business owners. I, I know a lot of your listeners uh, are facing a dark period when they, when they go through bankruptcy, but it's also an opportunity to reinvent. You know, you know, 2008 was the Great Recession. I think 2020 is the Great Reinvention. Not because business is changing, but because customer demand has changed and it will change forever. There is a new market and it's us small business owners that are going to adjust and accommodate the new needs. Um, this is the great reinvention, therefore, of small business. And if we use this as an opportunity to spring for, springboard forward and change how we serve this market, we will be the next major players uh, after this crisis is over. So I'm just rah rah small business. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love it. That's awesome. So I will put uh, links to your website. I'll put links to Profit First. I'll put links to to fix this next. And, and I know Thanks, you've, you've written a bunch of other of other books that I that I mentioned uh, in your introduction. Wow. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much. Sure, it's been a joy. Thanks for having me. 
Yeah, so uh, I think that'll do it for this week's episode. Like I say at the end of every episode, I hope that you have more money at the end of the month and not more month at the end of the money. Uh, Thanks again to my guest, Mike Michalowicz, and we look forward to talking to you in next week's episode. If you have questions that you think would make a great topic for a future episode, please email Sean or connect with us on social media. Sean Yesner and Yesner Law PL are Florida licensed attorneys. The information contained in this week's episode is not a substitute for legal advice. Your situation may differ, especially if you are located somewhere other than the state of Florida. If you have questions, please contact our office or contact a local attorney. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Crushing Debt Podcast. Podcast.